Hi, and thank you for joining me for this very short lecture. Someone emailed me recently and asked me, what does he have to do if he accidentally misses a night of slichot? And I told him that he must do the same, that if he intentionally missed a night of slichot, and that's nothing. What do I mean, friends? I mean that observing the custom of slichot is not halachic. In other words, it's not obligatory. It was just a custom created by later non-authoritative rabbis to help get you in the mood of repenting before Yom Kippur. Now, in regard to the origin of reciting Slichot, the custom is first mentioned by the later Geonim. For example, Rav Amram Gaon mentioned that the practice was said from between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, while Rav Chai Gaon states that the practice should be said from the beginning of Rosh Chodesh Elul until Yom Kippur. Today, everyone has adopted, obviously, the longer period as mentioned by Rav Chai Gaon with slight variations depending on what community you belong to. And in terms of the times and the liturgy, these were developed by much later rabbis stemming from Kabbalistic sources to just personal opinions. Not to mention that if you have a problem with Kabbalistic as well as post-Lurianic mystical ideas along with praying to angels, you probably should double check what you're actually saying to the Almighty during Slichot which is something that I don't have to tell you that many don't have in mind, mainly because most Jews, for whatever reason, they're not familiar with what is actually being said. Why is this important? Well, mainly because being that these prayers, along with the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur liturgy, deal with forgiveness and atonement, you would figure that they should be recited at least in a language that everyone is familiar with. Or at least an option in shuls should be made available for those who want to know what they're actually saying. And this is also an issue that affects many Israelis, i.e. people fluent in Hebrew, who many times have trouble understanding the Aramaic and even the unknown linguistical portions related to these prayers. Now, don't get me wrong, in terms of praying in the common tongue, or praying in a tongue that you happen not to understand, if this was a halachic issue, you would still fulfill your halachic obligation, even if you don't understand what you were saying. But in my opinion, it just defeats the whole purpose of Chazal establishing these prayers to begin with, which was ultimately to bring us closer to the Almighty. And again, this really has nothing to do with Tzichot, because these weren't instituted by Chazal. And know that there is no halakhic obligation to pray in another language other than the one you're most familiar with and understand. Which, when you don't know, makes your prayer just a mantra. Now, do I think there's anything wrong with the almost universal custom of Tzichot? Well... I do think that there's a problem with later rabbis creating many customs that ultimately were not sanctioned by Torah nor Chazal regarding on how we should relate to the Almighty when Chazal, who were sanctioned with his task, already gave us enough to deal with. And the truth is that I'm not alone in this area. Rabbeinu Avraham ben Harambam also thought that it was a problem. He even writes on how he was against the almost universal acceptance of this non-halachic custom because it took away emphasis on other halachic obligations, on how staying up so late affected individuals and in saying the morning Shema and the Amidah on time. Now, please, don't get me wrong. I obviously believe that sincerely beseeching the Almighty in repentance, wow, this, my friends, is a beautiful thing. The problem is, is that when it becomes part of the mandated yearly liturgy, because, friends, the truth is that you cannot sanction repentance. And it's even, if you think about it, a bit absurd to even assume that we can. And you're probably wondering, how did this custom start in the first place? And, friends, it began the same way all non halachic customs that supposedly become socially binding begin, by non-authorized individuals thinking that they know what's best for us, ultimately altering Jewish life to fit their outlook. Which is one reason why the Rosh Hashanah liturgy has become... A service that takes over five hours instead of the hour service that halakhically it was intended to be. Which ultimately has individuals opting out altogether instead of fulfilling their original halakhic requirement to pray on that day. Which, like I said, really took about an hour and at five with all the extra PU team that were added. But the truth, friends, is that this is just one reason why many, many are of the opinion that it is too hard to be a halachic towards you, mainly because of the many non-halachic practices that have been embraced, that from a Torah and halachic level were never sanctioned or authorized by the Almighty. Unlike the practices developed by Chazal, the Sanhedrin, the Beit Din Gadol, which the Torah itself gave the authority for. And friends, the reason I'm giving this short lecture in the first place is to help you be able to differentiate between what's binding and what isn't, mainly so you don't forsake your real Torah and halachic obligations for made-up ones. For more information on everything Jewish, please visit TorahJudaism.org. Thank you.